Hey guys, welcome back. Um, this is the last video on uh, introduction to Python, which we will look at style. So this one, I think the video might be a little bit long, so sorry about that, but um, just make sure that if you're watching on a video player or YouTube, you can set the speed up a little bit faster to uh, save time. Well, style is quite important in programming because even if you write some excellent code, if nobody else can understand it, um, you know, that's not going to be very useful. It's going to be hard to maintain, hard to update, upgrade, or debug, and so forth, right? So the readability is actually really important in terms of when it comes to software engineering and programming, right? So we'll have a look at some style guideline that we will try to use in this unit. And the styles do get checked, so make sure that you uh, do understand uh, different aspects of how to write your code meaningful and elegant. So what is style? Well, style is the way in which something is said, done, expressed, or performed. So you can find this uh, from the free dictionary.com. Um, but in terms of programming, when we uh, think about style in programming is the focus of correctness, uh, readability, and maintainability. Okay, so in a nutshell, if you can't read it, others can either. Right, so make sure that you can understand it and others can understand it as well. Okay, um, people may think that writing short program, short code is efficient, but not necessarily. It's more about the logical layout that makes the code efficient rather than uh, shortness of your code. Right, so make sure you worry about the efficiency after making sure that your code is readable uh, by everybody. You, uh, that you're working with, okay? Um, so just key note is that a slow right answer is better than a fast wrong ones, okay? Um, all codes needs to be readable uh, and correct, where written code is easier to debug. So maintainability is actually one of the um, large issues in software engineering. Um, for example, uh, Windows 10 has millions of lines of code and you see the updates coming out regularly and that's part of the maintenance, making sure that uh, what the product that we use is um, safe, does it what it's supposed to do without uh, errors and so forth. And all those updates are part of the maintenance and maintenance for pretty much any of the projects is an ongoing thing. So it is very important part of uh, coding and software engineering. So key aspects of uh, program style is that does it have good identifiers? Does it have a good layout? A good breakdown into functions? Um, complexity being under control? Does it have des descriptions in Python? It's called doc strings, right? So all those things uh, will assess whether your program is a good style or not. And all those styles will also be checked for some of the labs that you'll be doing uh, associated with Python. So do keep these in mind. Okay. So out of all those things, uh, things like good identifiers, layouts, those are quite straightforward to understand, but things like good breakdown into functions uh, may be a little bit difficult. So we're going to look into details about how do we break down functions um, into more understandable um, part of the code. Okay. So functional decomposition is a technique that we use to break down some of the large functions into smaller ones. So it is better understood and better maintained. If we have a large piece of code that does a lot of things, then uh, we have some restrictions. For example, if something goes wrong, we need to find out where it went wrong and that can be very difficult to do if the function is very large. Uh, and also, if uh, some other functions need to use all the functionalities provided by this big function, then it's very hard to uh, pinpoint the specific region that we need to use um, and try to avoid executing some of the other codes. So maintainability and also possibly efficiency can be reduced uh, by having a lot of functionalities in a single function. Therefore, it is important to decompose functions 
precisely to capture um, specific uh, tasks associated with the functions. Okay. So uh, these are the some of the items we'll cover. So let's have a look. Two main reasons to write functions. Make the codes easier to understand and make the code reusable. Re reusable is very important. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, rather, if somebody has implemented it, you just want to uh, bring it and use it for your own. Okay. So here is some example that we're going to look. Right. Uh, job one: clean the room. Right. Um, get a vacuum cleaner. Go to the room. Um, unpack the vacuum cleaner. Start vacuuming. And then if you do that for 10 minutes, then you're done. You can pack it up, lock the room, and you can go back. Right? Uh, if you have a different job, for example, clean the garage, right? you pack the vacuum cleaner, you can go to the garage, you unpack the vacuum cleaner, you start vacuuming. Uh, garage is pretty large, so you have to vacuum for half an hour, 30 minutes. Uh, once you're done, you can pack up the vacuum cleaner, lock the garage, and go back. So maybe you're kind of capturing some repetition here, right? So here's a job three, clean the stadium, you pack the vacuum, you go to the stadium, you vacuum for half of the day, and then you lock the stadium and you can go back. So if we uh, implement clean the room, uh, clean garage, and clean stadium as separate functions, there are a lot of overlaps that um, it is really unnecessary to repeat, right? So we can do much better than this like this, a generic recipe, right? Uh, basically, what we want to do is identify some of the common um, uh, structures and use it in the function and identify things that change but gets used in the same place. And those will be passed in as our parameters. Parameters. Okay. And in our example, there were two things that were repetitive in the same locations, which were location and duration okay so where we are cleaning and how long we are cleaning okay so here we can rewrite it as pack the vacuum cleaner go to the place unpack the vacuum cleaner start vacuuming for how many duration and then lock the place and go back okay so now we can easily call the function with those parameters clean room 10 minutes clean garage 30 minutes clean stadium 12 hours and when we put those uh, arguments into the locations of the function, it will have exactly the same description as we did before. So we can use a single function to capture essentially the same thing uh, by reducing the complexity. Okay. And there are two sorts of functions. One is called procedures and the other one are called the other one is called real function. Okay. So what's the difference? Essentially uh, the, the way they are structured will be the same but they have some a different goal. So procedures, what they're trying to do is uh, they want to uh, do things like printing the outputs or uh, display the results, things like this. Um, it's basically they're trying to show you the result, whereas the functions they're trying to evaluate. Okay, so procedures don't return a value, but functions they have a return at the end. Uh, procedures will likely have uh, print outputs using uh, print functions or even writing to a file, but real functions, uh, they don't necessarily have a print functions or interact with files, okay? Uh, and this is the style guideline. The names for procedures uh, will start with the verb, so it's doing something, whereas functions will describe more about its characteristics, so they're likely to be more of a noun, okay? So the way we use them is slightly different. Procedures, you just call them directly because procedures, we are not evaluating anything. So here, print table 10 or compute result input data. Whereas functions, they are computing something. They're evaluating something which re returns us, returns us uh, some a value that we didn't know before, right? And therefore we want to save it. So it looks like an equation. Uh, error equals standard error data or, or print. Uh, max rainfall data because it returns something we need to print it okay. 
So how do they arise? All right, where do we start building functions? Well, functions arise from uh, three different ways. Uh, firstly, uh, deliberately from top-down design. So we can go from designing our product and then start implementing the functions as we go along. Or during the refactoring, when you try to clean up the code, so you wrote some code, but it turns out to be much larger than you expect. And then you're trying to extract some uh, regions to make it more concise functions and then call them back in your large one. And lastly, by discovery. Okay, uh, But mostly, when you're working in a software engineering team, uh, the top-down design is what you will likely to be working on. And then uh, a mixture of uh, refactoring and not much of a discovery. But those are the three main ways that functions do arise. Okay. So here is a functional extraction example. This is one that is focusing on the second point. Okay. So here we have a function that is rather uh, quite long. Here we have a main function and it does a lot of things. And essentially what it's doing is counting um, number of um, uh, ifs, whiles, uh, definitions, and so forth in a code that gets inputted uh, in the process. So you don't worry about file processing, we will cover this uh, much later on, and also about what these guys are doing. But essentially what we're trying to do here is, what is this function doing and trying to understand what it does. So how can we clean this up? Just like before example, we have a lot of repetitions. So before going over to the next slide, think about how you can uh, clean this code up by grouping together some of the similarities. You can pause the video here. So, where would you start? Well, I have some uh, rules that you can uh, use if you're still unsure which ones you want to group together. So, any sequence of complete statements uh, can always be pulled out into a separate function by identifying all the variables that must be defined already for the statements to execute. So what this is saying is that whichever line, how many lines, we can always pull it out and make it a function as long as we identify all the inputs they need and capture all the outputs they generated, which will be used by the remaining um, pieces of code. Okay. And then identifying, uh, yeah, so identifying all the variables that gets defined or altered by the statements and are needed by later code, right? So those, those are two points. The inputs and the outputs of the function that you're going to create by pulling out those pieces of code. However, for this to be sensible, uh, the function should have a role, right? So when you pull out something, it should have a role. By reading the code, you should understand uh, what is the goal of this function. Okay, um, so let's have a look at an example. Probably makes better sense. So here we are, back to this uh, code. I cut out a little bit because um, I have description here. So let's say we want to pull out this block of code as a function. Yeah, so this is probably different to what you had in mind before, but this is uh, just a bad refactoring example. Okay. Um, but if this refactoring looks like what you had in mind, then um, be worried. But I'm pretty sure nobody is. Anyway, um, yeah, so let's make this into a function. We need to identify all the inputs we need, the variables, right? So here, input values we need are num for loops because num for loops gets used here. Um, I cannot do plus equals one without being defined. And then I have lines and then file name gets used here, file name, and uh, lines, okay? And then outputs uh, num while loops. Num while loops gets used in other places, okay? But everything else here, uh, I don't need to define it again. So those are the inputs and outputs. But again, this is a bad refactoring, hence identifying these is quite challenging. Okay, so don't worry about it if you don't understand how to specifically identify inputs and outputs. Uh, it, will make more, it will make more sense as we learn more about different programming um, ideas. Okay. So if we do that, then our function looks like this. However, 
we can't really give it a good name because it's a bad refactoring, so we just call it a silly function. Okay, and essentially these middle block is the same as the code that we pulled out, and then the top line is just the uh, uh, function definition, uh, function name here, and the inputs, and then return whatever we needed to return, and then call it uh, num while loops equals here. Okay, but um, this is not very good because we cannot reuse this code in other places. And therefore, this is not a, a good example of refactoring. Um, we can probably do better, right? So hopefully the next slide is what you had in mind, which looks like this. A main function is going to call count fors, count whiles, ifs, and definitions, right? So this is probably what you have identified before. Uh, basically, those uh, blocks of codes are counting um, different uh, operators in our co uh, in the code, right? And therefore, we can pull these out separately. Then we don't have to actually return anything because each one just prints something. So these are the procedural functions, right? It counts and then returns. And to do that, we just need the lines and the file name. And for the whiles, ifs, and similar for the definitions. So this is much better uh, approach where when we pull out a function, it makes sense and we can give it a, a better name for it. For example, counting fours, counting whiles, counting ifs, right? Uh, and we can do even better because when you think about counting, they are counting, uh, the way it's counted is the same. It's going over a bunch of lines and check whether it exists in the line or not. And therefore, um, by uh, putting in what we want to count as an input parameter, such as here, for, while, if, and def, then we can reuse a single function over here, uh, used it again and again. So let's test it. Here we are. So this is the original code code main, run it. Again, if I run it, this function will be loaded onto the local variable scope, therefore the name exists. So I can call main. Okay, enter program file name. Uh, what file do I have? I have uh, sing send maker.py. Let's use that. Sing send maker.py. Okay, so it tells me program things and maker has no loops, no while loops, one if statement and one function. So it's a very simple function, right? And I have main two, essentially this one over here, uh, implemented here. And we want to make sure it does the same thing, right? So let's call main two. Enter the file name, we'll put in the same function that I am using. If you want to test this, you can uh, just create your own uh, random function with a bunch, bunch of definitions or find some code online. Uh, GitHub is an easy place to find some code for pre uh, testing. Okay, And here we have 0011 up here, 0011 down here. So it performs the same, uh, but we have made it much more concise and more meaningful. Okay, so this is a better way of doing um, function extractions and making it more simple and concise. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a better understanding about how to write functions more precisely and, if necessary, um, decompose a large function to small one. Anyway, moving back to style. Okay, so decompose is part of the style because if you have large functions, it's hard. To, yeah, I explained everything before, right? So. Back to style, is the code generally nice and readable? And nice and readable can be quite subjective, but uh, we do have some rules. For example, good identifiers, layouts, uh, functions, complexity, and so forth. Let's have a look at individual items, right? Names, well, what we want to do for variable names is essentially use lowercase letters. So try not to use up, uh, uh, uppercase letters uh, for variable names, and if needed, uh, separate the words by the underscore. 
Uh, don't break rules for acronyms as well. For example, like HTML, uh, just use the lower letters. Okay, so that's the uh, guideline. And use longer and more meaningful names for more wide scope variables. For example, uh, like length of words can be used rather than just like L, right? Or standard deviation rather than just SD because some other people can be confused for uh, different abbreviations and so forth, right? So use a meaningful name uh, wherever possible. There are some exceptions uh, when, it, when we want to use some short variable names. For instance, here's an example. Uh, no, uh, uh, you shouldn't use any one character identifier except i, j, and k for uh, loop variables uh, and c for generic character and s for a generic string. When you submit codes later which are style checked, these will also apply. So if you use anything other than these variables, uh, the style checker will complain about it. Okay, So keep that in mind. And also variable names should be at least three characters long by the definition of the style checker. Okay, So make sure it's at least three characters long. The similar idea applies to function names. Um, try to avoid avoid using some uh, hard to understand function names, but function names should be something that is more concise and easy to understand. We know what it does by just reading the name. Moreover, try not to redefine built-in functions. For example, we had print. Um, what else did we have? Int, list, length, all those are pre um, uh, built-in functions, you can uh, redefine them, which means overwrite them, uh, by making your own, but it's not a good idea to do so. Okay. Um, also, we talked about procedural functions and real functions, so make sure your naming uh, is more concise to determine which uh, function they are. And program structure, we had a look at the decomposition, but essentially, you want to break a program into smaller functions, right? And also, obviously, yeah, give them a good name. Um, another key thing is don't use global variables or codes. Uh, I'll describe more in the next slide. And at most, we should use 40 lines per function, including comments. So these will also be picked uh, by the style checker when you do the labs. And at most four levels of indentations. So whenever you go into the function, uh, whenever you write a function already, it's already one level of indentation. So you shouldn't go um, more than four levels there. Ideally, you shouldn't have to use any break or continue. We will cover these um, a few videos later. And also avoid using cryptic code. So this means as a reader, I have to decipher what you're trying to do, right? Clever codes are necessarily cryptic code. So do understand the difference and write clear codes uh, as well. Okay? And very importantly, don't reinvent the wheel. Use Python's library functions if it already exists. For example, there are a lot of sorting algorithm codes. You don't have to rewrite them. And we talked about the global variables and codes. Uh, we don't want to use global variables because in Python, it's very easy to overwrite the value associated with the variable, right? And if we have similar uh, variable name used in different uh, functions, then it can be mistakenly overridden. Okay? That's, that's the, one of the key reasons why we don't want to use global variables, right? So, in that sense, you should also avoid using global codes. So here's the import, uh, example, import blah, and then we have x equals 999, y equals blah. So this will compile fine. You can use this. However, in terms of style, you shouldn't be writing this. Instead, you can rewrite it like this. So we chuck them into a function. We give it a doc string, uh, which is a description of the function, and then call the function at the end, okay? Having said that, um, using global constants is okay. Uh, what it means is, is a constant value 
that gets defined once at the beginning of the beginning of your program and it can be used in other places and for example uh, here's a threshold value which gets defined as 0 0.00001 and now this is global um, what this means is we are unlikely to change this value anywhere else but here okay uh, but if we do use this value instead directly in the code later when you want to update your threshold value you have to find and update every pieces of code that contains this value and this can be quite a daunting procedure as your program gets larger so global constants are okay global variables are not okay okay so keep that in mind layouts uh, try to have about two to three blank lines between functions and at most 80 characters per line how do you know 80 characters per line here's a big red line that's 80 characters by default in wing id so that's very easy okay and also don't write multiple statements in one line so we wrote codes here like this um, i can separate multiple statements using semicolons so then i can define i equals one two uh, j equals 1, something like this. But um, this can be quite uh, difficult to trace and find all those um, codes where they're supposed to be. Um, for example, when if there's an error at, say, line 6 where I had a long code, then you don't know which statement is causing the error precisely. Right? And also, lastly, use white space around operators. So here's an operator, uh, multiplication, equation sign, and minus. Put spaces between those two, right? Uh, before and after, and not this. So this will also be picked by um, our style checker when you do those labs. Okay? And comments are very important because when you write a function, not necessarily everybody will understand what it does and therefore you want to document what it does okay so every program must have a doc string at the top stating its role author and the date that means before anything else at the very beginning of your program you should write a doc string so here i haven't wrote one but i should write a doc string and doc string is essentially just a string encapsulated in three double quotation marks but uh, the definition of strings I'll describe later. So this is a test program. So this is now what we call a program doc string. Okay, it's the beginning of all the program program doc string. And then every function must have a doc string uh, at the start specifying what it does. And this is called a function doc string. So in this function, I already have it. In here, this is a function doc string main function read file uh, can't require attributes right so this describes what this particular function is doing okay and anywhere else uh, use comments as necessary because sometimes you write some complex code you want to comment and see how they uh, explain how they work so when later some other people see your code they can also understand it okay good code should be readable without comments but you know there are places where some complex code needs to be written and therefore well-documented code um, is necessary. And don't comment bad code to explain it, rather you should fix it. Okay, so that's a key point about comments. All right, so here's an example of the function doc string. So I just showed you before, but here's one again. So we wrote a Fahrenheit uh, function in the previous video. Um, but we didn't put a, a function doc string but now we can put the function doc string in here so this fahrenheit function what it does is converts a given fahrenheit temperature to celsius so if some people are not really familiar with fahrenheit or degree um, terminologies then by reading this function doc string they can understand better about what this function does okay so every function should have a descriptive doc string that starts and ends with triple double quotation mark wow that's hard to say anyway um, this will help not just you but others who need to use your code and also possibly debug it right and also provides online documentation so by using help fahrenheit it will show you what you wrote uh, inside 
a function doc string. So we had a main function before. So let's go help main. And in here, it will tell me what the main function does. So it says main function read file count required attribute. It's repeated here. Main function read file count required attribute. So when I want to look up the help of the function, this is what gets returned. Okay, your doc string. Therefore, this is why it's very important. If your function gets used by others a lot, then they are likely to look up the help. And if you don't have these documentations, then they are unlikely to understand what your function does. So uh, that's it for going over the style. So hopefully you will write some beautiful code throughout this unit and onwards. Um, yeah, otherwise, I will see you in the next video. Bye.